Welcome to the Startup Grind. Well, welcome to Brisbane. We really appreciate you making the uh, trip to be here tonight. No, it's great. I'm loving Brisbane. I'm coming from Melbourne where it's raining and it's cold and it's, you know, so it's, it's awesome to be here. Yeah. Levi, we were keen to hear about you before we kind of get into the delivery story. So tell us a bit about, you know, your background and, and what you studied and I suppose the things of your work over the past 17 years. Sure. So I actually studied uh, graphic design um, a good, uh, probably almost 20 years ago. Um, I got into design and from design got into manufacturing and worked in fashion for about 10 years um, through manufacturing, local manufacturing in Australia and then moving overseas and offshoring our manufacturing plants to, to China and to India. So I spent a lot of time in China and India um, and that was probably for the first yeah, five, six, seven years. Um, and then moving towards e-commerce, as everyone sort of jumped onto the e-commerce bandwagon um, in early to mid 2000s, um, and really understanding what that means, how you can put a store online. Now it's just commonplace, you just expect it, you just want the best, you want the fastest. But back then it was about um, just having a presence and not actually understanding what to do with it. Um, and then fast forwarding the clock a little further, moving out of sort of the fashion and a little dab in equestrian for a while, equestrian clothing. Um, started working in tech startups. So looking at um, what we can do as a business to get, on, get off the ground and what are we innovating. Um, so this was a range of different startups that had to do with um, eyewear. And from eyewear, it went into sort of um, mobile apps, or at that time wasn't really apps, it was mobile web. Um, and having conversations with, uh, with a large group in Australia called uh, the Catch Group or Catch of the Day. Um, and Catch of the Day is a company that's been around now. It's actually got, just had its 10 year um, birthday. Um, so it's a large company, one of the great success story within Australia. Um, they've invested heavily into startups. Um, and at the time they're looking at different startups. And some of them that are in there that you know today is, you know, Scoopon, the, the Catch of the Day is actually purchase, purchasing sites. Um, Eat Now, which um, then became Menulog. Um, and what I was headed up and put in charge was Yum Table. So Yum Table was a restaurant booking platform. Um, it was a way that you could go to restaurants around the country, these were fine dining restaurants, um, putting technology with the restaurants online in a way that these restaurants hadn't previously had before. Um, this enabled people to book online, um, to be able to, them to get you know, small amounts of discounts. It wasn't sort of your, your big scoop on a Groupon deal. These were restaurants that were pretty high end who wanted to encourage diners to come at maybe their off times as well as sort of their busy times. So worked with that um, and scaled that over about a year and a half, two year period into about two and a half thousand restaurants around Australia and grew that quite strongly. Um, at the time, there were a lot of interesting things happening in Australia. So if we look at the food space, um, you know, about a year and a half ago, um, a company called Just Eat, which is based in the UK, purchased Menulog um, for over $800 million. And that was a Menulog Just Eat combination. Um, and it really opened the eyes of investors from outside of Australia, as well as out internally to look at what is going on here in this food tech market. Why is it so interesting? Why would a company pay that much money for a company that they could probably create themselves? Um, and so that was something that as you look deeper and realized what the scope of you know, the food industry and food tech in Australia was, you started to understand the value that, you know, Just Eat, Menulog, Eat Now, those sort of businesses were bringing to the table, as well as looking at the dine-in sort of options, which at the time was, you know, then it was called Book a Restaurant or Open Table um, or Yum Table. So looking and seeing how people are sort of applying this um, on-demand or app-based sort of feature of taking dining to the next level. Um, so that was looking quite interesting. Uh, How long were you at Yum Table? Just over two years. Yeah, right. It must be an interesting part of that group, which you know, was quite innovative. And... Yeah, it was a fascinating group. I mean, as I said, they just had a 10-year birthday. Scoopon, they started in 2010. Um, that was a very fast-growing business. Um, you know, they, they fostered the Eat Now business from their founder, who was Matt Dyer, who came in part of the business. And watching that business grow and understanding that, sharing the learnings between the different business units, um, you know, the technology that we used, the way of business that we, uh, that, that we went to, the agileness that we were able to do whilst being quite a large company, um, was something that um, you could only learn from and, and I learned a great lot from that. So. Yeah, great. So tell us about Deliveroo, how long have you been with them, how did that come out? Yeah, so I've been with Deliveroo for now just over, just around about a year and a half. 
Um, so Deliveroo, um, as you mentioned, is, is in 12 countries now, but at the time they were probably in about seven countries or six countries. Um, they had started four years ago and started in a very small city in, um, in London. Um, working there, um, basically, if we take two steps back, the founder was, was um, a US um, citizen. He lived in Manhattan, worked for Morgan Stanley in finance, worked lots of late nights. Um, if anyone's been to Manhattan, you can pretty much get anything you want on demand very quickly, especially food from great restaurants. Um, so something he was used to was breaking bread with his colleagues um, at night, at work, putting down his pens and actually you know, bringing out the great food, enjoying that for half an hour, 40 minutes, and then going back to the grind. So what happened is he got transferred across to, to London in the early 2000s. Great population density there, excellent restaurants, um, you know, affluency or disposable income to a level that you'd expect um, was you know, quite similar to Manhattan. Um, however, he found that you know, working those same late nights, he didn't have uh, the same sort of food available. You could get pizza, you could get kebabs, you could get you know, food occasionally from what we think of delivery from you know, five, ten years ago, uh, but nothing that you could not feel guilty about, nothing that you could do on a regular basis. And it actually made him quite curious and sort of like, why is it like this? What is wrong here? What, why isn't this not working? Um, and he looked at it and, and basically um, from that said, you know, took a step back and said, what's missing here? So it's the customer experience, it's technology, it's understanding of, you know, trusting that my delivery driver is going to turn up on time. Um, you know, going back even a year ago or in Australia, even currently with, with some providers, you can order, it's a bit of Russian roulette, you don't know when things are going to turn up, it might be cold, it might be hot, you don't even know what the restaurant is. So he wanted to change all that. So um, through building, first, first of all, he did deliveries for nine months himself just to understand what that was, going out there on the ground, doing those deliveries, hanging out with delivery drivers, sitting in the front and back of restaurants, understanding the gripes that, you know, that restaurants can have, riders can have, um, how they were treated as, as, as people as well. Um, took that, added technology and built the company and started in London and sort of grew a little bit further. They added a few more countries. Um, one of them was France, um, Germany. Um, and then they started realizing they wanted to have, or, or, or not sort of realizing, but actioning that they wanted to have more global um, sort of countries. So they looked out and wanted to understand, you know, who has great um, adoption of technology? Who is sort of a foodie country? And to what the knowledge that they had sitting in London, they looked at Australia and, you know, UK and, and Australia have a lot of synergies. They looked at Australia as a place to go to. Um, at the time, being where I was at Yum Table, they reached out and had conversations in terms of, you know, what do you think about delivery in Australia? Where do you think it's going? And this was just, this was like two months after this massive acquisition from Just Eat um, to Menulog. So uh, it was a very interesting time. So I gave my feedback, we, we engaged in conversations, um, and pretty much, I mean, it started on LinkedIn. So if you're not on LinkedIn, you should definitely be on LinkedIn and make sure that your, your profiles are good and you're active in that area. Um, and so, and that's how my catch of the day job came about as well. So just a little lesson out there. But so they reached out and had conversations and, and basically said, look, we'd like you to run um, that in Australia. So that's what I started to do. Great, exciting time. Can you just talk us through the business model of Deliveroo? Yep. Has it, has it worked, what makes it really Yep, so I think, first of all, the, the unique difference of what Deliveroo is versus anything else that's out there. So Deliveroo predominantly works with restaurants that don't deliver. Um, by that very nature, we're working with restaurants that are high-end or gourmet. It might be a gourmet burger place, it might be a high-end restaurant. Um, so it's something that's quite different. Um, as mentioned before, when you think of delivery, you're thinking of pizza and, and sort of like your, your usual sort of um, delivery options. Um, so we wanted to sort of target, in a very hyper-local way, restaurants that you would recognize. These would be restaurants that you might go through with your partner, with friends, with colleagues, restaurants that you enjoy. And so that would be the one side of being hyper-local. And the other side is that we recognize that we wanted to be able to deliver food very quickly. That was important to customers. Um, and so by building our areas that we deliver in, in set ranges in, in each city, um, that enables us to uh, deliver the food in a very short amount of time. At the very core, we're a technology company. So what that means is that we're very rich on data. We look very carefully. We obsess over the customer journey, the data that's provided from our riders, from our restaurants, from our customers. And through that, we do what we do, and we operate in the restaurant space. Uh, we plan on only working with food. We don't, you know, we're not going to be delivering, um, working with couriers who are delivering mail or, or working with Apple and delivering iPhones. We're looking at only working with food, and that is what we've built our business on over the last four years. So, that's the business. The way the business actually works in terms of um, how we monetize, so we take a $5 fee from the customer in terms of a delivery fee, um, and then we also take a clip from the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. How, actually there was a really good question that just came in, which I think is relevant when we talk about Australian growth. Um, 
when you when you took over and did in Australia, apart from having a very Aussie sounding company name, which I'm sure has helped, where did you start? Like, how did you go about establishing you know this business from the ground up? Yeah, so yeah, so definitely the name um, has, has a positive and negative. So it was something that people straight away sort of recognised. I thought, I've heard of that before. I know what that is, even though they, they didn't. Um, the, the troubles were you sort of walk into you know some of these big um, chef-headed restaurants right in the beginning a year ago when we first started, and you have a conversation. Hi, we're delivery. We're looking to work with you and bring your restaurant on our platform that does delivery and that say deliver who and like you know deliver deliveroo and like oh cute you know. You're some small Aussie startup, well, good luck to you, but we're not really interested, or we're a headed restaurant, we don't want to sort of go down. So that part is sort of like, no, no, actually, we are sort of a little larger, and, and then we sort of, we didn't want to sort of come out like, you know, we're invested, we're 12 countries, or whatever. It was more about what we did. So that's how we started the conversation, and we had to iterate that sort of, that pitch. But in terms of building the business from scratch, um, having an understanding of what the landscape was is obviously very important, it doesn't matter, you know, what business you do. Um, but in terms of getting it started, was really reaching out to my own network. So, you know, talking to people that I've worked with over the years um, and looking at them and saying, look, hey guys, this is the business that, that I'm walking into right now. I think you'd be great in an operations area. I think you'd be great in a marketing area or a sales area. What do you think? And they took a risk too. I mean, nobody had heard about Deliveroo. It was another delivery option as far as anyone was concerned at that time. Um, so everyone took a risk, but that's sort of what you build up over time with people. And we started a year ago with about 12 to 14 people. Right. And obviously being a marketplace, you've got kind of both sides to grow. Um, I assume you started with the restaurant side to build your supply, and then, is that, is that right? Um, yeah, so once we had the... Once we had the teams in place, um, we pretty much had to do both at the same time. So what we didn't want to have is onboard restaurants, speak to restaurants, get them onto our platform, and then go, oh shit, we don't have riders, <laughs> right? So we had to go and look at what do we want, what do we want to work, who do we want to work with, uh, who are we targeting? Um, and so that's when we sort of looked at our riders. So we had a team working on rider acquisition and we had a team working on restaurant acquisition. So the team working on riders went to universities, uh, put on ads up to, in all different places, banner ads, whether it was from Gumtree to Seek to other sort of areas, looking for people who wanted to ride. These were people who are, many of them had day jobs, were working nine to five and wanted to ride at night to earn extra income. And others were looking, you know, working in university or, or studying in university, looking for, you know, a way to earn, earn money whilst keeping fit. So depending on the cities, like we first started in Melbourne and Sydney, we were targeting, you know, in Melbourne with a higher uh, ratio of bicycle riders versus Sydney, um, based on sort of the topography. Um, and so the 90% bicycle riders, the 10% um, mopeds or motorbikes at that time. And in Sydney, it was more like 70% bicycles to 30% mopeds. That's now changed and it changes constantly as we open up new areas. So we did that whilst acquiring restaurants and magically um, as the two came together after about four weeks, um, yeah, so we had to start doing some marketing and let people know who we were. Yeah, great. Do you have any tips on, you know, I suppose, how you achieved that kind of fast level of customers within a fairly short time, starting from scratch? Yeah, so I think what we did is, I mean, right now where we sit, we're in Melbourne, we're in Sydney, we're in Brisbane, we're in Gold Coast, we're in Perth, um, with plans for expanding further within our cities and, and outside. But what we did is we made a very, um, focused effort when we started to start in, in Melbourne CBD and Sydney CBD, start right in the centre, um, not expand too quickly. I mean, we have expanded over a year very quickly in comparison to, to other businesses, but I think at the, very, um, at the very start for the first month or two, we're really proving to ourselves and to the business that the business model works in Australia. And to do that, the number one thing was to bring restaurants on board and not your average restaurants that were on board with other platforms, restaurants that you would not associate with delivery. The whole, the whole excitement was and the whole sort of curiosity was for the public is like, did you know that you could get Jamie's Italian delivered to you? Like, Jamie's Italian's gonna deliver on a bike? Like, that doesn't work. Or did you know that you're gonna get, you know, you know some of the restaurants that don't deliver, um, whilst, you know, whether it's a Nando's or a Guzman, you know, these are good restaurants, but they're not ones you associate typically with delivery. Um, so working across both those platforms, making sure that we hit people's budgets in different levels um, was, was really important to us. Yeah, right. This might be another question, I'm sure you get this all the time. In terms of, you know, packaging, keeping the food warm, all those types of things, how does that work? I mean, yeah, so that's, that was the biggest thing. So um, right from the get-go, because of our experience overseas and understanding the markets, and, and you know, partly before I came to Australia, um, well, I'm born in Melbourne, but before I came back to Australia to launch um, Deliveroo, I spent a good four weeks in, in London. I spent a couple of weeks in Berlin. So London obviously was a th three years into the business or two and a half years into the business was a very large business at that time. So it was great to see and understand the resources that, that we were fortunate, fortunate enough to sort of lean on. Uh, but at the same time, I went to 
to Berlin, which has just launched, and Amsterdam, which has just launched, to understand a team of four or five people, how do they do it? What are the problems that they're facing? So back home in Australia, before we started, one of the conversations I started having was with packaging suppliers, you know, telling that we are Deliveroo, again, not knowing who we are, we're going to grow very rapidly, um, you're a packaging supplier, you're, you know, you're, you're sustainable, you're eco-friendly, we'd love to put you forward to our restaurants, uh, but we want to work out some sort of offering that you can do for them. So as, as mentioned before, predominantly targeting restaurants that don't deliver, they don't have packaging. Um, so it's something that we have to bring to the table. So what does um, Australia, like localising the business for Australia mean? Like have you had to change much in terms of what you've in inherited from, from overseas? So most of our, um, if I look at our tech, our tech is adaptable to many different cities. As you mentioned, 101 cities that we're in and 12 countries, we're able to use the same technology in every city. Having said that, there are tweaks that we need to do, whether it's you know, looking at Kangaroo Point and understanding that a bike can't just go across the bay. Our technology looked at, looks at things in terms of as the crow flies. So from point A to point B, it should only take five minutes, but actually you've got to go all the way to the top and all the way down. So um, you know, we have to make those local changes like we did in Brisbane, as we did in Sydney with the different bays. Um, so that's on sort of a, a technical sort of side and a mapping side. Um, we are a logistics company um, based on that technology, so we do that. But on the consumer side, really tapping into sort of the foodie culture here. Um, you know, we've, we've been living in a culture where we've got, um, you know, MasterChef and all these food sort of um, shows that have been on TV for the last few years. Everyone's sort of getting into gourmet cooking. Everyone's sort of having an appreciation for food. People, you know, you can go to, you know, the same over here, you can go to a different restaurant every night for a month and still not do the circuit and come back again. So on a consumer level, that's fantastic. So, you know, there's a great appetite for this, um, but we need to tap into influencers, which we've tapped into in Australia, tap into different sort of networks, so whether it's digital, whether it's offline, really play with getting that, that customer acquisition in a correct way. Mm, great. Now, you mentioned your tech a few times. What, what does that look like? What, what are the key functions of your, your so our core tech is based on a whole lot of different algorithms that work out many different sort of variables to what a delivery can be. So uh, if we look at the whole journey for a customer, if you go onto our app today and you try and order, you will get the restaurants in an order of how quickly they can deliver to you. That might be 25 minutes, 30 minutes. That's based on a restaurant prep time. That's based on the driver time to the restaurant, which is included in the prep time, the driver time to the customer. So if we break down that 25 minutes, uh, what we're looking at is, you know, there could be a a 15 minute prep time by the restaurant, there could be a five or 10 minute delivery time from the restaurant to the customer, there could be some time there where they're finding the customer like knocking on the door or going to the sixth floor to deliver. Um, so what our algorithms do is they work out who is the closest rider. So what happens as a customer journey, you open up your app, you place that order, that order goes to the restaurant, they have an app as well on a tablet, it pings and makes a lot of noise. Um, the restaurant accepts that order straight away, um, depending on their prep time, a rider was dispatched, the rider needs to arrive at the restaurant prior to the food being ready. Um, and get the food from the restaurant to the customer within about six and a half minutes. Um, that time's really important. After 10 minutes, food starts going cold. Doesn't matter how, how well it's packed. Um, so we need to ensure we deliver in a short amount of time. Um, so the technology measures all that. It takes into consideration you know, the, the type of road that you have, the weather conditions, um, what was, your, what was you know, your speeds and what was the amount of riders that we had on the, uh, on the platform last week, this time, this hour. What's the predictive, you know, looking forward to this week, how many riders should we actually allocate to, to this zone or this what we call a zone, a suburb? Um, so it bases a lot of that information there and then looks at um, usage by customer. When are they ordering? How often are they ordering? When should we contact them? Um, so there's a lot of different technology that's going in on, on a regular basis. And that's something that you mentioned the raises that we've had. Um, that's the, the reinvestment that we've had into the business has been by our original investors as well as new investors. And that's to grow that technology further. Our tech team has grown from five people to 40 people to 80 people to about 95 people. And we plan on growing that to about 130, 140 people in a very short amount of time. Let's talk about funding. You have five rounds funding, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So can you give a quick overview of, or recap of what that's meaning? Yeah, so that funding started about 18 months ago. Um, so the first funding was about a, was a five million um, investment into the business, which was um, subsequently followed about six months later with a $25 million um, dollar investment, um, and then $75 million, and then 100, and then 275. That's all in US dollars. So um, as you mentioned, it's just over 600 and, and I think 680 million or 640 million um, that has been invested in Australian dollars, depending on the currency. Um, 
and what's really important to understand is, you know, we are living in a, in a market right now where, um, first of all, in Australia, it's extremely hard to raise money. Um, you know, you look at the papers these days and people who are raising money, whether it's $500,000 or $1 million, that's a hard thing to do. And I've been on that side of the table as well, going to businesses, looking for funding. And it's something that, you know, obviously people talk about the elevator pitch, people talk about your business. Uh, and that whole subject there is people forget to get customers. And a lot of people get very caught up in the startups and building the startup, coding, um, talking about, you know, to other sort of startups, how to build their startup, um, looking at the designs and the UX and all that sort of thing without even actually talking to a customer. And so that's, a, that's an error that, that often we make. And you need to go out and speak to customers because they're going to give you the advice that, that you need and they're going to tell you what's, what, what's right and what's wrong, not what we find in a boardroom or bouncing off each other. So, so with Deliveroo, from the get-go, um, as I mentioned before, Will, the founder, was out there doing his own delivery, speaking to customers, speaking to restaurants, understanding what that was. As a company, we only started marketing our business in the last probably year or so. Until then, our business was purely based on word of mouth. And that was what people were investing in. Investors were looking at what we were doing and watching this growth and saying, just, this is just incredible. Customers are coming back. Our returning rate is just insane. Like, why are they doing that? What is making this experience really, you know, really attractive? Um, and that is what we'll build. Um, so on that, the investment that's come in, you know, there is a lot of funders, a lot of in, um, VCs and other people who invested, including Greenest Capital, DC Global, some of these names that, that you would know, recently was led by Bridgepoint. Um, so some of these investors, so Bridgepoint has investment in restaurants as well, so it was interesting for them to look at understanding restaurants and then coming into a technology company. Other ones like Green Oaks or, or DST have invested in um, uh, tech companies before, um, of the likes of Facebook, um, Spotify. So they really understand how tech companies grow. Um, on our side, we've recently appointed a new CTO who came from Facebook, um, and that was a really big acquisition for us. He's coming in and changing things around in our business. We have other people from huge companies that are, that are doing that for us. And, um, you know, it is, as I said before, very fortunate to be part of a global company. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with that funding that comes through. So it's great to have that funding, but it's not about just spending that money. You need to understand where that's going. And at the end of the day, we need to make sure we're building a sustainable business. Yeah, definitely. And look, I mean, five rounds in 18 months seems like quite a lot as well. Yes. I, I know when we spoke, you indicated that a lot of that money had come from existing investors as well, so you weren't necessarily counting the doors or uh, I would say no. I, yeah, so whilst I may have only attended one or two meetings, I would, so our founder pounded the doors. So this, the climate right now raising money is very, very difficult. There are a lot of things in the, um, out there in the world that, that people are sort of looking at startups, trying to understand startups, you know, what's going to make it, what's not. There was a good eight, nine months that, that our founder did nothing else except for pound the pavement. So it was, it was really hard work um, to get the people on board. And is that capital raising kind of stopped now? Or is it going? I, I think uh, different businesses will always look at capital raising. Right now, we've just, you know, we've just closed Series E, and that money is going into you know, really two areas of our business. And one is technology, further investing in that technology, getting the right people on board doing that, and the other part is expansion, looking at expanding, you know, in our current cities that we're in, looking at expanding that further. You know, our biggest complaint that we get from customers will be, I can't get delivery yet. So why can't I get delivery? I've heard it, I've seen it. So what we want to do is make sure that we can give that to as many people as we can. So whilst we started in metropolitan areas, we're expanding to more regional areas now. So how does that work? You said that a rider needs to be able to get to the destination in six and a half minutes. That logic would then also say that you can really only get deliveries from your local restaurants. Correct. Is that right? So I guess you're in the process of extending the restaurants further out. Correct. So we will still maintain that model. So that model will be we want to decrease the rider time, we want to decrease the customer experience time. But what, we, what is really important to us is that food is delivered in a short amount of time. So we build areas. So, um, you know, in Brisbane, for example, we started a new farm. So that's where we started. We built, the, we built that area with the restaurants in there so we could distribute to that area. Then we went to Fortitude Valley. And so Fortitude Valley was our next area that we opened. And we were able to borrow riders from one area to another area. So the beauty of what we're able to do is that we can go, we can, you know, go up and down depending on demand. So if one area is having a huge demand or spike, we can pull riders in from one area to another area and vice versa. Where if you look at a typical business that, going back in the old days, had their own riders, on a busy night they could never keep up, um, and so, and, and on a quiet night they're paying the riders for not doing anything. Our business is performance managed, so that means that if you're at a restaurant and you're doing really well, so you're getting riders doing deliveries. If you're not busy that night for whatever reason, you're not paying for anything because you don't have a rider there. How do you reward drivers? Drivers, I 
Thanks. Sure. So, yeah, so our riders are two wheel transport. So, um, throughout the globe, and, and, and the same here in Australia, our riders are either bicycles, mopeds, motorbikes, or e bikes. Um, we use that mode of transport because we want to get from a, we want to get from the restaurant to the customer in a very short amount of time. We don't want to worry about parking on either side, uh, which takes, which eats into that time or food um, going cold. Um, so, in terms of that, um, you know, that's something that we that we look at sort of continuing as as we, as we go further into our space, um, and that that will continue even if we go into regional expansion. Mm, great. Talking about growth, um, you've had some big impressive growth figures locally as well. Can you tell us about those and what you think the keys to that success has been? Yes, yeah, so growth is probably our biggest enemy, to be to be truthful. So, like, we love our you know our growth. We're growing at approximately thirty percent month on month, um, which is insane. So, what that means is that you know pretty every every two months or three months, we're, we're literally reinventing our business and doubling our business. So, it's it's something that whilst it's exciting, it's something we need to manage very carefully. So. Um, you know, being responsible with funding means making sure that we don't grow too fast, that we build something that's not sustainable. Um, and it's hard to manage, you know, how many riders do you need to have on next week? We're doing a partnership with this company or we're doing a promotion here or, or something went crazy, we brought on this awesome restaurant that, that, that no one would ever have dreamed of coming on board. So understanding what that means and the spikes that they have, you know, we can make mistakes. And that's part of being a startup is that we will screw up and we will make mistakes. But embracing that and learning from that so we don't make that same mistake. And, um, again, you know, from city to city, we'll make a mistake in Melbourne, make sure we don't replicate that in Sydney or vice versa or through Brisbane or through Perth or Gold Coast. So we want to do that locally, but also lean on what's happening overseas and understand that too. Yeah. What are the key marketing techniques that you're using to bring business? Um, so we're still enjoying, or we have been enjoying um, being agile in that area. So we have probably dabbled in most marketing um, uh, initiatives that have come forward our way. So, you know, we use traditional um, branding right now, which is ATL, so out of home, so we're putting you know, billboards up, we've got buses wrapped, we do that type of thing. Um, that's more for brand awareness, but essentially for looking at a business itself, that's not sustainable. We've got to look at ways that we can acquire customers better, and digital is the way to go. So we do that through a mix of SEM, through social, um, which is you know, Facebook, Instagram, a little bit on Twitter. Um, so we're looking at all different ways of expanding that further. Um, but then again, looking at other ways, whether it's video, it's content, content is king, and People say that, but it's about seeding your articles in the right places. It's great being in huge press, but it's also looking at other areas, you know, seeding an article in sort of a gaming website, which has huge amounts of people for us. These are people who are usually sitting in front of computers or TV screens at home, not wanting to leave, who are hungry, right? So it's a really good place to be for us. Plus they have a great followership online and their DA score, their domain authority score is very high up. So a link on their site means a lot of great SEO value for us. So looking at whatever we can capture on that side, as well as partnerships. What comes back to knowing your customer, right? Yeah, knowing your customer and knowing where your customer was before they came to you. So looking at any business, where is your customer before they came to you? Wherever that place is, you need a market there. Do you know what your acquisition cost per customer is? So yeah, so it varies from, from medium to medium. So on our digital um, platform, you know, on SEM, we have a certain CPA um, cost per acquisition. On, a, on Facebook, it's different. On ATL, it's, it's, it's obviously a lot higher because that's, you know, it's a lot less measurable. On, um, and we have you know, different ways of acquiring customers. We have a great member get member referral system. So if you're a customer and you, you're, you're on delivery and you refer a friend and they buy, you get a $20 credit, they'll get a $20 credit, right? So it's a really good way to provide advocacy within the, within the, uh, the company or within the customers that we have already. That's how we built our business in the first place. So it's great that we're able now to reward our customers in the same way. Great. You spoke a bit about data. Can you talk about innovation as well? I mean, it seems like the Maroos quite an innovative business. Is that something that's built into the culture of the company as well? Or how do you kind of keep that in mind? Yeah, so we're innovative in, in quite a few different ways. On the data sort of side, what we're trying to do is bring to restaurants data that never had before. So some of these restaurants are, are pretty, uh, pretty tech-savvy restaurants, but even being tech-savvy restaurants, they're missing the sort of data that we are able to present. Um, with our delivery, we're able to present them heat maps, which can just demonstrate where the restaurant is, where all our deliveries are going. And for a restaurant owner, that's extremely visual. And the more visual sort of data, the more ways that we can express data in a visual way, the easier it is to digest for you know, restaurant owners or any business person. We have like data coming out of everywhere. And so no, data becomes very noisy. So you need to understand the data that you pick, 
how's it important to, to which partner? How's it important to this restaurant? One restaurant might be really interested in the prep time. So if you look at chains, they want to know like, you know, why has this restaurant got a 50 minute prep time while another restaurant has a 10 minute prep time? Because that affects how much money they're making. Whilst another restaurant wants to know like, where want deliveries going? How come they're going here and they're not going to this area? What can we do about that? So, so you provide that Dallas restaurant Yeah. No, so it's a regular basis, and I guess the two USPs that we've got, the two unique selling points that Deliveroo has when we look at sort of the marketplace and look at globally is, one is our technology. Our technology is built around restaurants, so we understand it's not a matter of moving A to B, it's understanding how one restaurant can be different from another restaurant, how delivering to an apartment block or a, or a house or a property is going to be quite different to each other. The other point is really the customer experience, and that customer experience boils down to our account management. So we have people who go on a monthly basis, depending on some restaurants, or weekly or fortnightly, and sit with the owners and really explain to them what they're doing. At the end of the day, like any business, it's a partnership. It needs to work on the restaurants need to push it, we need to push it and work together to maximize what we're trying to do, which is increase the revenues by up to 30%. Yeah, great. Tell me about Rubox. Yes, so is that, this, is that here or is yeah, so Rubox is something, and to take a step back and look at the whole sort of ecosystem of um, food delivery, um, if you think about food, you think about food delivery 1.0. So food delivery 1.0 is what we used to do five, ten years ago. You know, you, you call, you call um, Bobby's Pizza Place, um, you tell him you want a pizza, he'll go send out his son Johnny, he'll get a pizza, he'll somehow get on his bike or in a car and bring it to you somehow, the little 14-year-old kid that you'll tip and you'll get the food and that's all that was really out there. And it was, you know, you had to have cash and the guy came, you didn't have cash, so what were you going to do? It was all a little bit complicated, a little bit hard. It sort of worked because there's no other choices out there. That was food delivery 1.0. Food delivery 2.0, if you look at that, is more about um, you know, what happened with aggregators. So people who bring all these restaurants into one place um, so that you could have a cashless system. You could actually log on, put your credit card details in. You could see a multitude of restaurants. You may not know who they are or where they're from, but it was an easier way to do it. You could do it through a website and sometimes through an app. Place that order. The restaurant would automatically receive it through, through an SMS or through a, some sort of um, communication way. Um, they would then prepare the food and then go back to Johnny and say, hey Johnny, we've got this food now, go out and deliver it. And we don't have enough drivers, we do have enough drivers. And again, that was a little bit of Russian roulette. So I don't know what restaurant I'm getting, I don't know if it's gonna be delivered in an hour, there's no one really to speak to, I'm sort of stuck and hungry, I'm getting frustrated. But again, we sort of lived with that. Restaurant 3.0 is what we do. So restaurant 3.0 is taking care of the whole experience. So place the order, it's cashless, it's three-step process on your app, the food is uh, made by the restaurant, our technology brings the rider to the restaurant before the food's ready, brings it to the customer, gets that all that happening, the customer can rate it, tell you, you know, if it's, you know, the five-star, four-star, is it, if there was an issue, was it the rider, was it the food, was it something else, provide that feedback and really give that loop that we need. So that's where we are now. So restaurant 4.0 is something different. So we explained before that we work in a very hyper-local way. So we base, you know, we look at population density, we look at restaurant supply, we look at who lives in that area that we can supply to, which is great and is what we've been doing. But as I said before, the problem is, is that customers out there want to deliver and can't get it. So we've got people who are living, you know, 40 minutes from the city, who work in the city, understand Deliveroo, understand the restaurants we deal with, but live in areas that cannot access Deliveroo. So what we're doing with Rubox, and that's something that is part of what we're investing in now, is bringing restaurants to those places. So we'll take um, four or five of our top restaurants. These are names that you'd recognize anywhere. Um, we'll take those four or five restaurants, we'll build those restaurants, delivery only kitchens that will be in these areas that might be 40 minutes from town, might be in a different area that can service this population. And that solves two problems. So the first problem is customers living out in those areas want to, they have a great food appreciation, they're watching all the shows we're talking about, they're getting into cooking, they love, you know, they're getting a great uh, spread of cuisine that they want to have. Now they're able to get these, these awesome restaurants delivered to them in a short amount of time just like anyone else. So that solves that problem for the customer. For restaurants that are doing really well, they want to expand. So we have restaurants coming to us weekly now saying, I'm looking at opening a new location. Levi, if I open this suburb or that suburb, on a delivery case, like how much money would I make on delivery here versus here? And we give them that data. We say, well, over here, you'd approximately make $5,000 a week or $12,000 a week, let's just say. And they'll make a decision of where to build the next restaurant. But the problem is still building a restaurant. And that can cost you a million dollars, a few million dollars to go and invest with that. And you don't even know if it's going to work. So what we're providing for them is removing that barrier of entry, letting them come to these areas, work for six months with us. It's not a pop-up. So they work with us for six months, 12 months, um, working on delivery. And for themselves, the best case scenario is they go, 
this is an awesome place to be. Build a restaurant now that you've tested it, and we walk away and we take care of the delivery part now and not the restaurant part. So that's what Rubox is. We've rolled that out now in London in quite a few suburbs. We're in the middle of rolling that out in Singapore, and we plan on rolling that out in Australia in the coming months in a few different cities, including Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. Great. Well, it's exciting. It's a new approach and uh, something that's definitely different here too. Let's talk a little bit about competitors. Obviously, there's a growing number of competitors in this space. What does that mean for you? How do you feel about that? What are the differentiating points for you? Um, and I suppose, what's your, what's your plan? Cool. So I can't tell you everything, but <laughs> what I will tell you, <laughs> what I will tell you is that um, I think, it's, I think it's really exciting to see the, the type of competitors that are in our space. And what that means is that it's proof there that there's demand, um, that companies um, who are competing with us and, and companies around the world get into this market you know, are backed by pretty serious investors. And you would not enter this type of market, whether it's Australia or whether it's the food tech industry in general, if you didn't believe there was actually a market to have. So first of all, it validates that this is a serious business that we want to be in. The other thing it does is competition is extremely healthy. Right? So we, are, you know, we, we obsess over the customer, we obsess over the journey, we obsess over our technology. But when you have a competitor in the market, you have to take it to the next level. Um, we are continuously raising the bar, and we become our worst enemy because as we raise the bar, we've got to deliver on that. And as we raise the bar, we've got to deliver on that. And to the customer who didn't have Deliveroo a year ago, it's now commonplace. And so we can't talk about, we didn't have it a year ago, so appreciate it. We need to make sure that we are, we are stepping up every single time. So, that brings that into the space. We have a lot of respect for some of our competitors out there. Some of our competitors have grown very quickly in a very short amount of time in what they do. But I think what we do is we focus on one thing, and we focus on food and food delivery. Um, and so that is something that is very um, in our space. In, in our space, there's a very small amount of competitors who compete directly with us. That is something that's unique to us, and that is something that we believe that we'll continuously build on. Um, how we compete with that and what our plans are. So our plans are to keep on delivering the way we're delivering, to give our customers deliveries that they can bank on, but also to work with partnerships with like, you know, similar um, audiences to us, our, similar to our demographic, whether it be male or female, depending on what our demographic is, similar to our age group, working out how we can bring them value, but bring us value. So using the network effect within our network, but also with our partner network. And you know, we've made some pretty large announcements recently um, with some partnerships that we've done, and these are the ones that we're going to take forward into the future. Have you found any challenges in the Australian market that are unique to Australia specifically? Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, there are quite a few challenges that are, that are unique to Australia. Um, whilst we have a very you know, great foodie culture, our population is not as big as other, other cities. And when you're looking at um, you know, population density as being key, it makes looking at our business model as how do we adapt to, our, to, to Australia. If you're looking at you know, Paris, for example, which is a huge densely populated area, or, or London, for example, and then try and compare that to Melbourne or Sydney in different areas, we have different complexities. Um, you know, even in London, there's not, there's not a lot of high-rise buildings. If you look at our CBD areas you know, in Melbourne and Sydney, and as well as Brisbane, there's a lot of high-rises or, or tall buildings. And by doing that, that puts a stress on how the way we deliver and how we deliver um, to those places. So, that's on sort of the logistics sort of area, but also on sort of the customer acquisition area, we need to target it differently. Australia is a mature market, uh, or more mature than some of our other countries that we're in when it comes to food tech and food delivery. So again, breaking through that noise, letting people know what we do, it's an education piece for our consumer and for our restaurants and something we're continuously working on. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's your key challenge at the moment? What keeps you up at night? Um, I would say there are a couple. So number one is growth. Um, as mentioned, we started uh, just under a year ago um, with about 12, 14 people on our team um, spread across Melbourne and Sydney. Um, we are now sitting at uh, approximately 100 employees in our company. Um, so that's you know, crazy growth in that. So in that comes its own challenges in, in terms of growing around Australia, growing our people. Um, a lot of our, our, our people become managers very quickly, making sure they're, they're skilled, making sure that we're supporting them, um, continuously reinvesting in our staff, so putting them on training programs to make sure that they, you know, they, they are working relentlessly. They are working around the clock. Um, we're, we're fortunate enough that we have a brand that people recognize, so you see delivery riders on the street, you see the equipment they're wearing, it's very bright, it's very reflective, so people recognize it. When other startups, you don't get that recognition straight away, so you know, we enjoy having that. Uh, but at the same time, it's managing sort of our people as they grow, and, and that would be a big part of it. Um, the other challenge is, is ensuring our riders are safe. Um, so, 
you know, every city in Australia has different weather conditions, you know, and it could be torrential rain, it could be boiling hot, it could be windy, making sure we have the right type of riders on board, making sure our equipment is, is great. So we've recently changed all our equipment globally um, to be super reflective, um, you know, from the backpacks that they wear, or the boxes, um, or their clothing. That's extremely important. The majority of our deliveries are done at night, they're done on the weekend, so we need our riders to be seen. So that keeps me up at night, making sure that they're okay, you know, having the insurance in place that we do have for them, um, you know, is, is a good peace of mind. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that they're, they're trained right. So that's part of what we do here. We have one of our operations managers here, Lachlan, sitting in the crowd somewhere, and he works hard working um, with the riders to make sure that they are trained, they understand food safety, they understand the road rules, they understand how everything works, they have lights on their bikes. So these are the things that they're probably I think about a lot. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. There's, there's a lot to think about. Yeah. What, um, what are the key tools that you use um, um, so some of the things um, we built specifically for Deliveroo, and that, and that is you know quite unique to, to what we do, and it based on sort of the resources that, that you have you, you you work with. Other ones we sort of adapt. So for example, in Australia, we work very closely with Dropbox. So you know all our employees have access to Dropbox. We gather a lot of data, not the data that's in our, um, our proprietary systems, but data from restaurants. So menus and images and contracts and um, that sort of information. When we bring riders on board, they're getting criminal checked. They're, you know, we, we take registration details if they've got a moped or, or, um, or other sort of vehicle. We take photos of sort of their, their bikes. We make sure that we know what's going on. So all that data's got to sit somewhere and sit somewhere that everyone can access in a, in a very easy way. So we use Dropbox, um, we use Salesforce. Um, you know, a lot of these things are not um, expensive to have, especially depending on if you've got a team of four or five, your Dropbox li license will not be very expensive. Same thing with Salesforce. These are ways that we can build. So whilst we concentrate on some software that we build uniquely to what we do, there's other parts that we can adapt. And so building everything is, is probably almost impossible. Um, so we concentrate on building what we focus on and then using supplementary tools like Salesforce and Dropbox. Mm, yeah, great. Do you consider delivery still be a startup? Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's you know unfairly compared to, to small startups, it's not. Whether it's an upstart or a startup is, is, is still up for question. It's a startup in the way that, the way I define a startup is that we are continuously changing. We are, conti we are not happy with our model just yet. Like we love our model, but we are, we are not gonna sleep at night saying we've done what we needed to do. We feel that we are still scratching the surface, especially here in Australia, we've only been here for a year. So there is so much that we need to do on the customer journey. There is so much we need to do on you know, CRMs, retention strategies, making sure customers are continuously engaged with us. Um, so th there's, we're continuously building our teams, getting smarts into our business to do that. So, um, and we are continuously iterating um, and trying to improve and trying to innovate on innovation. Um, so we're very much a startup in that way. Where we're, where we're sort of becoming less so a startup is that as we've grown, we have over 800 employees now around the globe, there are systems and processes in place. And even within Australia, having a team of 12 or 14 people a year ago, we sat around one table. And you know, we broke bread, we, we had fun, we went out. Um, most people did about five different functions. Now we look at our company, everyone's broken into departments and they do that. Whilst we still engage very closely with each other, we've now become, whilst being nimble, a little heavier. And so what that means is we need to make sure that processes are in place. We need to make sure HR processes are in place. So we have to slow down by no stretch of the imagination of corporate. Uh, we still you know, embrace a lot of fun. You know, eating food is one of our values and eating lots of food. Um, you know, having fun, going out there wherever we can. Getting on the bikes ourselves and doing deliveries is important. I, I, not as, I don't do nine months like our, our founder did. I ride every second week doing, doing deliveries myself. That way I can see the restaurants, I can see the customers. We encourage anyone who comes on board with us to do deliveries as well. It is part of our fabric. So you need to be able to do that. And if you can't ride a bike, we'll teach you. And if you, don't have a, if you want to ride a moped, we'll help you with your license. So um, it's something that is very much a, a, a very startup feel. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, that's good to hear. I was, I was wondering about the deliveries and if that was integral. So it's interesting to yeah, I think until you've done the whole ecosystem, we, as, as a new employee, you'll do deliveries, you'll sit on customer service, you'll take calls from customers who may or may not be happy. You will work with riders, you'll work with marketing and accounts. We want you to touch every part of the business and then fall into the place where we hired you for. Yeah, definitely, that makes sense. Got a few questions coming through here, so um, I might run through a bit of it because I don't think I'll get through them all otherwise. Do you use Net Promoter Score? Yes. 
So we, yes, we use a net promoter score, and that is something that we use through customer feedback. So there's a few different ways we measure. We measure on, on where our app review is. So we have KPIs that we need our app reviews to be high, higher than four. So higher than four, we sit about 4.5 in Australia, so um, still room to go there. Um, yes, yeah, so we think that box, but we're still, still room to improve um, on the net promoter score as well. Um, so we very much listen to that. We need to understand, we look at customer feedback. Um, right from the get-go when we started, we would personally write back to customers. I would personally write back to customers if they had a bad experience. We had a small team. I still jump in on that point, but we have teams now who will write back. If you have a bad delivery or, or we, because of our predictive nature, we can tell if something's going wrong. So you know, hungry people are hangry people, so we want to make sure we get to you before that frustration kicks in. It's a, it's, it's really, yeah. So it's something that uh, we want to call, if something is going to go wrong, if the weather is bad, or if there's a delay at the restaurant, or there's a problem with the bike, we want to call you before that food comes and say, hey, just wanted to give you a call and let you know your food's running five minutes late. And usually people are like, cool. Or if you just d does arrive late, send you a text message within a few minutes saying, hey, we've noticed it come late, really apologize. Or if it's come later than a few minutes, here's a credit for next time and we look forward to working with you or having you on board again. So that's something that uh, we definitely listen to customer feedback. Can you, you prepared to share any of your net promoter score and your targets around? Yeah, so our net promoter score um, in Australia is about 65. Um, so that's, that's pretty high for those who understand that. Uh, one thing that um, people need to realize with net promoter scores is, and especially being a global company, it's very hard to compare a net promoter score from one country to another country because of cultural differences. So, you know, a net promoter score in, in Germany versus a net promoter score in, in Australia could be quite different where in Germany there might be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more hard on where in Australia might be, yeah, she'll be right, I'll, I'll give you this. So you need to understand sort of that, but within our own country, um, that's a pretty high score. That fluctuates, so we could have a terrible weekend where, where weather is just a massive factor um, where people may not enjoy really on time deliveries and we do the best that we can and we'll monitor that over those two days or three days we drop from 65 to 55. But then we want to make sure that all those customers who had a bad experience who got deliveries more than 10 minutes late or whatever it was, we contact it. Every single one needs to receive an email from us within 24 hours to talk to them about what just happened and why it just happened. And so by doing that, we, we push our net promoter score back up again. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any um, restaurants that are concerned that they don't have that kind of end contact with the customer? So, so there's certain things that we can do to, in, to engage that with the customers, so with the restaurants and the customers. So um, restaurants want to ensure that they still have that connection. Now, due to privacy laws, we don't hand over email addresses and mobile numbers and all that to the restaurant. Um, but what we do um, give the restaurant is an ability to get those customers to come back into the restaurant as well. We do not want to cannibalize the restaurants. The restaurants that we work with are restaurants that are, as mentioned before, they're great restaurants that you go to. We want to encourage you to still go to those restaurants. All we want to do is add on an ability for you to get them also delivered to your home or to your office where need be. So restaurants that are, that are not all restaurants do this, it depends on how energetic or you know, how forward thinking these restaurants are and, and how much activity they want to have. Some of our restaurants we work with are promotions. So, you know, dine with delivery four times and the fourth time you get something to come back into the restaurant, whether it be a bottle of wine or free dessert, to bring them back in. And the restaurants themselves enjoy that. So we work closely with the restaurants to build um, initiatives like that. Some restaurants don't mind, they just want more revenue and just bring it to me. Other restaurants are very concerned about that. So we want to make sure we address that too. Do you have a, like a return rate figure on your customers? How many deliveries do they yeah, so we, we, have a very, we have a very high returning rate customer. Um, so if we look on a daily basis of our returning customer rate, uh, we have about 70% you know, of our customers on a daily basis are returning customers. So that means we're getting a, a really healthy returning customer rate whilst we're very active in the market on onboarding acquisitions. So we need to be pushing that strongly to get new customers. We don't want to just you know, keep on feeding the same customers. We want to bring on new customers, open up new areas as demand grows. So you know, we're getting a healthy injection of new customers. So that's what we have on a daily basis. Um, we look at continuing that. And it's depending on your business objectives, you've got to work out, you know, do you want to increase that returning customer rate higher and lower your acquisition, or do you want to increase your acquisition? So right now we're doing both. Great. Does it, is there some trends for you in terms of how long it's taking the new city to become profitable at the moment, or you know, how many areas you need to open up? Yeah, so our, our business is based on what we call um, throughput. So um, that really means that the number of orders a delivery rider can do over a certain period of time, the more orders that can be done, um, the more profitable a business can be. Um, so therefore, you've got to look at what we said before, population, and making sure we've got enough population density, make sure we've got enough restaurants. It's not just about having restaurants. We've got to make sure we've got the top cuisines. We've got to make sure that we've got restaurants that hit different price points. We have to make sure we have restaurants that are opened 
you know, all different times of the day. We, have, we do brunch deliveries on Saturday and Sundays now and we're looking to expand that into Brisbane. We do late night deliveries. Um, in, in Victoria, we do alcohol deliveries um, together with food. So we're looking at expanding that now to Queensland and to New South Wales. So um, all those different sort of areas helps us do what we need to do um, in terms of growing that. Um, but yeah, that's probably as far as I'll go on that one. Um, we spoke a bit about competitors already. I, I, I guess we're getting a clear picture as well that your technology is a real differentiator in that. Um, when we talk about companies like Uber Eats, for example, do you think they are building the same kind of technology behind their food delivery that you've got, or is that a concern for you guys? I'm sure they're trying. I mean, in terms of Uber as a business, we have great respect for Uber. And if you look at what Uber's built in a very short amount of time is in the car share, car riding um, experience and what they do getting customers from A to B, um, they've done a fantastic job there. Um, as mentioned before, what we do is, you know, we build our technology based on food. What Uber, um, I believe, is struggling at the moment is adapting that technology to the restaurant um, industry, to understanding what that is and, and how to do that. Um, we're very into making sure that, as mentioned before, we're building a sustainable business. We're building a business based on customers who are going to keep on coming back to us. And whilst we have, you know, incentives for customers to recommend their friends, we want to stay away from, you know, hugely flooding the market with vouchers. We want to stay away from areas that customers won't return. We spoke about returning rate before. We talk, talked about CPA before, cost per acquisition. We spend a lot of money marketing to our customers and getting them on board. What we want to make sure is that they're coming back time and time again. So we've been doing that from the get-go. Um, players like Uber have different ways of marketing, um, and so that's, that, that's sort of the way they do their business. But in terms of what they do and how they're doing it, they're learning very quickly, they're growing very quickly, and as mentioned before, I think competition is great, keeps us on our toes. Um, but what we're looking at is really creating the world's best food delivery experience. And that's a big, that's a big statement to make. Um, we are in 12 countries, so I guess we can talk on that sort of global level. Um, but that's something that we're looking to create. We haven't created it yet. We're still, we're still working very hard at that. Um, but uh, we're quite confident in terms of what we're doing. And I think the, a great pat on the back has been through the recent races we've done with our investors who have reinvested in the business as well as acquired new investors into the business who during a period, like I mentioned before, is a difficult investment sort of environment that we are, looked at Deliveroo, looked you know, under the hood, saw what they, you know, loved what they saw and have gone with what we're doing. So, yeah. Good response. And what about Google? Is Google coming into this space as well? I think Google dabbles in lots of things. I mean, we work with Google in, in many different ways. Um, you have, as mentioned before, there are lots of different players. You have Amazon entering the space um, overseas in different areas. You've got Google, you've got Facebook now sort of doing, getting involved in food too. Um, so I, as mentioned before, everyone is looking at this food um, tech space and going, how do I get a piece of it? Um, and that's where I think time will tell to see who are really the leaders. Um, but I think we've established ourselves quite well um, in really rock solid foundations of what we're doing. Great. What advice would you have for other businesses in this game around Australia? So I think if we're looking at startups or even any business, I think we, you can innovate in any business you are in, whether you're in a corporate or whether you're in a startup, you can look at that business and you can innovate. You can change the way things are, are being done. But on a startup level, it's about focusing. Um, it's really focusing on what you're able to do. We were able to expand very quickly because we already had the technology that was available to us. Um, but if I look at um, you know, different startups and, and what has worked and what hasn't worked, it's that focus and focusing on that customer obsession, but also focusing and not thinking too quickly that I need to dominate the nation. Think about how can I get Brisbane right? What can I do in New Farm or um, in, in, Kangaroo Point, or if we're looking at Fortitude Valley, where we know there's a lot of sort of young people in sort of in the tech space, what can I do there? How can I test my, uh, you know, get an MVP out there, test it, make sure it works, and then you know go a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. What we find with you know many startups is that they go wide very quickly. So this this works, let's just roll it out, and that's where you get in trouble. Similarly, like a, a restaurant who is doing great with three locations and then quickly expands to five or six locations and then goes broke. So you need to be really careful on that. And so my biggest um, sort of recommendation would be to focus. And, and whilst it's good to pivot and iterate, be careful that you're not trying to add too many services. Um, you know, an interesting story for us was um, probably about four or five months ago, Apple contacted me directly from California and said, look, we're launching iPhone 7 out in Australia. Australia has one of the highest adoptions of iPhone um, in the globe. Um, we think you know, we could have a real 
you know, great fun here with Deliveroo as being a leader out there. What if we were to do something that Deliveroo could deliver the first iPhone 7s around the country to those people who registered and be great promotion for you and you're getting started in Australia, be awesome for us to have such a, you know, get your iPhone delivered in 15 minutes, get your MacBook delivered in 15 minutes, you know, something like that hasn't been done before. So, you know, it was quite exciting dealing with a brand like Apple and in Australia we had just launched Deliveroo and, you know, we entertained it and, you know, I had conversations with our founder, Will, about doing that and we, we spoke back and forth and, the answer of that was actually, thank you, but no thank you, we're not going to do that. Um, and the reason why we took that stance, and whilst it would have been a great sort of, um, you know, something that we could do, it was something that we believed at the time, if we start doing that, where does it end? We're going to find ourselves down the rabbit hole doing things for, you know, for postal deliveries or, or, or working on, on some other sampling or doing some other sort of thing. And before you know it, we've diluted our business. You know, we've got companies, you know, pharmaceutical companies coming to us in Australia saying, we'd like to work with you in delivering pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have other sort of companies coming to us um, in the food space, but not in the food space as well, wanting to work with us and saying, well, you've got riders anyway. Wouldn't you want to use those same riders maybe in the morning when they're not working for you? Um, and whilst that makes sense to a point, it's deviating from what our path is. And so we don't want to go down that path. That path will mean us tech changes, more investment, may not work. We know what we do works. We've worked with those unit economics. We understand how that works. Um, so that's what we focus on. Yeah, it's really good advice, I think. Staying true to your core purpose. Yeah. What can we expect in Brisbane in the next few months from delivery? Um, so yeah, exciting times in Brisbane. So. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is there's, there's obviously more restaurants we're bringing on board. You know, we do customer surveys with, the, with um, our customers in Brisbane and every city, and we understand from them what restaurants they want to bring on, as mentioned before, what locations they want to bring on. So you know, we are looking at spreading our, our wings further in the, city, in the area, suburbs that we are, but also looking at you know, Ascot, which we're opening up shortly, and other sort of areas that people are flagging that they want to go to. Um, we are looking at new modes of transport, so whilst we're dealing mainly with bicycle and mopeds, getting more into the e-bikes, um, that's something that's quite sustainable. Um, it's something that doesn't cause rider fatigue because you have you know, the battery um, pack there to help you. Um, so looking at that on the, technical, uh, the technology side. Um, but also, as mentioned before, Rubox is quite exciting. There are areas in Brisbane and, and, and out of Brisbane, um, you know, city centre, that have great population, and some of you probably live there. And so we want to work with bringing those great restaurants to you so that you can also access delivery. Fantastic. Sounds exciting. I'm sure we'll be eager to try after tonight. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. If everyone would uh, join you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.